Okay, so this is the introduction to the next series I'm making, and it's going to be on the different uh, tracks, the spinal tracks of our body. So this is in neurology, with the neuro lecture, neuroanatomy, and we're going to start off with the spinal cord, and I'm going to talk about like different ways, like us ascending and descending tracks, and then we're going to get into the big picture of things. When we get into the big picture of things, I'm just going to talk about it broadly, and then in separate videos, I'm going to have like different tracks, like one track doing this, a descending track doing that, etc. But we'll get to that in the future. So first, we're going to start with this structure right here. So this is cerebrum, right? This is going to be the top of the brain. And I have the brain stem right here. You just see like a little brain stem, it's small. And this hole right here, this is the foramen, uh, foramen magnum. Remember when we did the structure of like the skull? And I showed you the different foramens that meant holes, and we looked at it like this, like you're looking down, it's like a bowl or something. The foramen magnum was the biggest hole. So if it's the biggest hole, if we remember, that's where the brain stem goes. So the brain stem's going right through that hole. Not bad. Okay, as the brain stem travels down, right? Travels down, travels down. What is this structure right here? I have all these little bones. Every square is a bone. These squares, this is representing the spinal cord, as we know. And all these little bones are vertebrae, not bad. And they're color coded, right? I color coordinated it. So the black ones are going to be the cervical. The blue ones are going to be thoracic. The green ones are lumbar. Sorry, green ones are lumbar. Purple is the sacral. And the baby blue is the costagio. Okay, what does this mean? Well, let's do a quick overview, quick anatomy overview. You have seven vertebral, um, seven cervical vertebrae. We're going to have 12 thoracic vertebrae. We're going to have five lumbar. We're also going to have five sacral and we're going to have one costagio. What does this mean? Well, you see these lines that run through all of them? These lines are going to represent nerves. Okay. It would make sense that every single vertebrae has their own nerve going through it and that the spinal cord runs directly parallel to the vertebrae. However, that's not how it works. It's not an ideal world. Okay. So if you see here, this is the spinal cord, right? And he's also color coordinated to the vertebrae. How? Okay, so you see for the cervical region, right? The black spinal, the black region of the spinal cord. He's directly on the same plane, like they're the same level, the cervical. We travel down a little bit, and you see it starts getting bundled up. Like you start getting bundled up by thoracic, and then it's even more bundled up by the lumbar, lumbar and sacral. Why? That's because the spinal cord, when you're an adult, it kind of ends around L1 to L2. This L1, L2 region. Okay, why? Well, because we grow, as we're growing, we're growing a lot faster than our spinal cord can keep up with. So the bones keep growing and the spinal cord just stays at one space. So whenever they say you have to do an anesthesia or a lumbar puncture, you're going to L4, L5, that region, like L3, L4 probably. Why? Because if you put the lumbar puncture in right here, they're not talking about the nerves. They're talking about the vertebrae. So you put the needle in right over here, you're not going to hit the spinal cord. You might hit some spinal nerves, but you're not hitting the spinal cord directly. That's why they say this is the safest place. Okay, let's move on. Though. So you see I have like little numbers here, right? In between all the different regions. What does this mean? All right, so the cervical segment has seven vertebrae like we talked about. However, this guy's the only different one. Of course, there's one guy always out. He has eight, he has eight nerves. How? Okay, so the first nerve for the cervical is running above the cervical vertebrae. Okay, so he's going to be cervical, verte cervical nerve 1. Now I'm not going to write CN because that's cranial nerve. So we're going to write nerve 1, right? The second cervical nerve is right underneath the cervical vertebrae. So that's nerve 2. And if you proceed down, right, nerve 3, nerve 4, nerve 5, nerve 6, nerve 7, nerve 8. So all vertebrae, uh, all nerves run underneath their vertebrae, except for cervical. What does this mean? C1, right? The cervical vertebrae. The cervical nerve runs above it. C2, the cervical nerve runs above it. C3, the cervical nerve runs above it. The only different one is cervical 7, right? He's got the cervical nerve running on, above it, but he also has a cervical nerve running below it. Okay, there's the difference. Cervical uh, C7 vertebrae has two nerves going around him. The cervical nerve 7, which is above, like all of them, but he also has a cervical nerve uh, 
eight going below him. Okay. Now, if we remember in the video where I spoke about the brachial plexus, it's cranial, it's uh, not cranial, I'm sorry. It's nerves what? C5 through T1. Okay, so it would make sense if you just drew C5 or nerve 5 down to T1. This would be the first nerve, right? Nerve 1 of the thoracic segment. But didn't we say the cervical, uh, the brachial plex plexus was C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1? Yes. But they, when they say that, they're not saying it's the 7th or the 8th vertebrae. They're saying it's the 8th nerve. Okay. So the C7 vertebrae has the 7th nerve and the 8th nerve in it. It's not the vertebrae for the brachial plexus. It's the nerves. Just remember that. I know it's a little, like, off topic, but, like, it's something that I wasn't too clear with, and I just wanted to mention it quick. Okay. So if we erase this guy, just a little bit, and now we proceed down again. Okay, so T1, right? Below. T2, below. T3, below. All the nerves are running below. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Boom. Every single one of these nerves runs right below it. If we proceed down to the lumbar, same thing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Sacral, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And Casagio, 1. So every single one of these vertebrae on their cervical goes below their vertebrae. So, okay, so boom. Now we know how the nerves flow. But now let's talk about how the bones and like, or the other bundles that are occurring. Okay, so you see how the spinal cord comes down, right? The spinal column. We got a little bulb here, and then we got a little bulb right here. All right, so back to that little uh, brachial plexus thing I talked about. What was the brachial plexus? Well, it was when all the nerves, right, went down my arm, and they kind of like crisscrossed like the railroad tracks. Well, if that brachial plexus was between C5 and C1, let me draw that again real quick. Well, there's a lot of crossover with nerves. There's a lot of like jargon going on. So that jargon, what does it cause? It causes this little bridge, this little bubble to pop out. So that's why you see this little like bump. Okay, so this is for the brachial plexus. But you're saying, Joe, why is there two bubbles? Okay, well down here between around T7 to L, uh, T7, maybe T8 region. What do we have there? The lum or it's considered the the lumbar bones, uh, lumbar nerves, right? This is the lumbrosacral plexus. So this bump right here is for the lumbar and the sacral plexus. Okay. So the lumbar lumbosacral plexus is also going to have like a little bump. Okay. This should make sense because why? The lumbosacral plexus has got a lot of those railroad tracks, a lot of crosses, a bunch of jargon building up, and it's causing this little bubble to occur. It's causing a buildup. Okay. Now, how does this all come together? So, on the bottom here, right, we see this little, like, region. This region has, it's called the conus medullaris, right? It's L1 to L2. This is the bottom of your spinal cord. It's like the tail. Okay. And then surrounding this region, right, you see I drew like a little like sphere, a little circle. This circle is called the cauda equina. Equina, I don't know how to pronounce it. And this is between L2 and the costagule uh, vertebrae. But what is it doing? So this uh, region is just engulfing or circling, holding them together. The L2 and costagule nerves. So it's holding the nerves together. It's like wrapping them up. It's like a little like tie wrap you put on bread, right? You just tie them all, all together. That's what the cauda equina is doing. Or equina, whatever. Okay, so now, what does this mean? If you were to have a problem or something in one of these vertebrae, what is it going to compress? Well, it's going to compress this cauda equina. Okay, and now what happens if something was wrong with the conus uh, medullaris? Well, you're going to have a problem with what vertebrae? Or what nerve? The conus medullaris controls the costagile nerve. You see how the conus medullaris is branching out? It only branches out this one nerve. So you're going to have a problem with the costagile. Okay. That's really all I wanted to talk about for this. But I'm now going to intertwine all of this stuff with the vertebrae and the nerves. But before we do that, I want to go over one quick question on uh, the spinal cord. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick practice question before I move on. Uh, this really helps me retain the info and make sure I know what I'm talking about before 
I continue like studying, but if you guys don't like this, just put in the comments saying it sucks or just send me a text saying you don't want it anymore. Or you could just feel free to skip through it. It doesn't matter. All right, so here we go. Attempting to do a backflip with his bicycle off of a ramp, an 18-year-old bike rider fell from a height and landed on his feet. Okay, CT scan reveals a burst fracture of the L1 vertebral body. All right, he probably thought he was sick. He landed it, but he still fractured something. Okay, so it's the L1 vertebral body with a posteriorly displaced fracture fragment compressing the conus medullaris. We talked about this. Which of the final spinal cord segments, or following, I'm sorry, so this is probably the nerve, would most likely be impinged. So yeah, an impinged nerve by the bone fragment due to this injury. So what is this? So we have this, the L1 vertebrae posteriorly displaced, right? Okay, so what does that mean? If these are the vertebrae. Sorry, it's a circle, whatever. And this is the spinal cord. It's posterior displaced. It's hitting one of the nerves. One nerve. Okay, so I drew out the spinal cord before just because I was having trouble drawing and trying to film. So it's going to look a lot nicer. Okay, so if we remember, this is the spinal cord. We have seven cervicals, 12 thoracics, five lumbars, five sacrals, one cosagil, right? We talked about this a lot. Okay, and all the nerves. What else? Did we, what does the question say, though? The question says that we have a fracture of the L1 vertebral body. Okay, so where is he going to be? Let's find them. So these are cervicals. These are thoracic. Here's lumbar. Boom. Okay, so boom. There's the lumbar body. Okay, so this is what we're zooming in on, the lumbar one. Okay, and now it says what? The bone was uh, posterior displaced, so displaced, and what occurs? Well, hmm. One of these nerves are going to be impinged. Now, if we look at it, is it going to be any of these nerves? One, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, even S1? Probably not. Why? Well, because this bone is not just touching these nerves. The displacement or the, where the fracture is actually occurring, it's compressing right here. It's compressing the actual spinal cord. Okay, so what nerve is that going to be? Let's take it back from the top. Let's look at the answer choices. Well, T7, T9, and TL11 uh, are all kind of similar, so let's look at that. So here are the uh, thoracic nerves, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? And this lumbar vertebrae, is it piercing or is it uh, compressing any of the blue nerves? Well, it's not even overlapping the blue nerves. It's, it's overlapping lumbar nerves and sacral nerves. Okay, so we could cross out any of the thoracic ones. So that's not even a choice. See you later, buddy. Luckily, they gave us three. It's nice. So now we have a 50-50 chance if we have no idea what we're talking about. But we do know what we're talking about, so we're going to keep going. Okay, so now if this bone, right, is compressing the spinal cord, is it compressing any of these structures, the lumbar structures? No, because those lumbar structures are up here. Boom, 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 right? It's a little bit above where this vertebral body is going to be. Let me do a little quick erasing just to, I don't know, make it look a little nicer. Okay, so it's not hitting. This lumbar uh, bone is not compressing. It's compressing right here, right, this region. And all of these lumbar nerves are up here. Okay, what about the sacral nerves? Well, the sacral nerves have what? S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. It's supposed to look a lot nicer than that. I just couldn't really draw. If I just erase it a little bit and showed you guys, it would go a little lower. And all the nerves would be like that. Two, three. Not directly from the bottom, but you get what I'm saying, right? So you have uh, S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. And this bone is piercing this region, right? So is it piercing S1? Maybe. Is it piercing S2? Maybe. S3? Maybe. But the answer choices only gives us S2. So boom. That's got to be our answer. L2 can't be, right? Because L2 would be up here. So we have cervical nerves, thoracic nerves. Nope, nope, nope. Don't even look at that. Cervical nerves. Sorry. Thoracic nerves. What is down here? Lumbar nerves. Boom. Right where L1 and L2 is. Sacral nerves and then costagil nerves. All right. So let's continue with the diagram or my whiteboard. Uh, I hope this question helped. I know it was a lot, but... I think we're good, we can keep going. Okay, boom, so now if we continue on, what are we gonna do? Well, we went over the question and we spoke about what? We spoke about if, I'm probably out of the screen, right? If one of these bones, right, gets compressed, it's gonna target one of these nerves. Okay. 
that's not even the most important thing of this video. I want to mainly focus on the different spinal tracts and why, say you pinch one of those nerves, right? Why is it affecting a different region of your body? Like why, how, how are you knowing? Like, how do you feel that? How do you feel that pain? Okay, so we're going to talk about what makes you feel it and what makes you fix it. Or like, say like I prick my skin, right? I feel that. How do I, or a bug lands on me. I feel a bug lands on me. How do I get rid of it? Well, I have to move my arm. Or if I step on a nail, how do I get off of the nail? I have to move my leg. How are we going to do that? Well, the rest of these videos are going to talk about different ways our body moves in response to stimuli. It could be physical stimuli, it could be external stimuli, sensory stimuli, etc. So we're going to talk about it. Okay, so if you see here, right, what, what, what are all these things? These are all spinal, like, this is a spinal cord, right? Cross-sectional view. So you just cut it in half and you're looking into it. A little, like, you have a spinal cord, you got cut, someone cut it in half and you're looking above it or you're looking under it, same, same thing. I like looking over it. In my head, that's how I look, think of it better, but whatever. Okay, so if you see the spinal cord, right? I have all these lines going through it. I have this little like, I don't even know what type of shape that is. But this shape, okay, let's look at the shape. All of these shapes are representing something. What are they representing? Well, they're going to represent gray matter. So this is all technically gray matter. What even is gray matter? Well, if you remember... Let me keep filling it in real quick. If you remember with like the neurons, we spoke about neurons and the neurons consisted of a couple of things. What do they consist of? Well, they consisted of dendrites, they had a cell body and they had myelin. Okay. I, yeah. What does that mean? Well, the cell body, right? And the dendrites, cell body and the dendrites, they were made up of consistently or they compose gray matter. So they are gray matter. So the cell body and dendrites, which is right here, right? Cell body, cell body, cell body, this whole thing. And the dendrites, a little like branches coming off. They're going to represent the gray matter. So boom, gray matter. Where is that? Everything I colored in, this is going to be gray matter. We're going to have an anterior and a ventral uh, horn for the gray matter. We're going to talk about that. Just let me slow myself down. I'm getting a little too excited. And then this blue region, if you could see, this is going to be the myelin. Okay, what was myelin used for? Well, if you remember in neurons, it's for conduction, right? The more myelin you have, the faster things go. Okay, so who cares? Well, the body does. So myelin, right? If it's the central nervous system, you're going to have oligodendrocytes. I, I wrote it. I don't know why I'm rewriting it. You have oligodendrocytes. And if it's the parasympathetic nervous system... You're going to have Schwann cells. Whatever. Who cares? I mean, people, it's not important right now. Just know that the myelin, right, from the, central, from the neuron right here, the stuff that helps with conduction, is going to do what? It's going to help speed up processes. Cool. And what are these processes going to be? Well, it's going to, it's going to make up the white matter. So the myelin is going to be the white matter. And the white matter is what's going to send our send signals to our brain. Okay? So this area right here, around all of these cross-sectional views of the spinal cord, is going to be the white matter. The white matter is going to have a lot of different tracks in it. We're going to talk about tracks in a little bit, but just know that tracks are a bundle of axons, so a bunch of all the fibers coming together, so they come together in this central nervous system, and they go to the brain. Okay? So these lines here, these are all going to be tracks. And talk about it, don't worry. These tracks, right, run in particularly through the white matter. The tracks run through the white matter. Okay, so what the hell does that mean? Well, let me show you. Can you erase this? So, if you have like a signal, right, and this signal touches uh, your leg, for example, that leg, right, that signal is going to run through your spinal cord, hit one of your um, spinal like columns, the nerve, it's going to shoot up through the spinal cord, get to your brain, so say your brain's up here. When it hits your brain, it's going to come back down. We're going to talk about that, and you're going to move your arm. So it's going to be the difference between ascending and descending fibers. But don't worry. As you see here, I have white matter, and I have gray matter. What, why do I have this written? I also have white matter decreases 
and gray matter increases. Why? Well, from the cervical to the costogeal uh, vertebrae, so this is cervical. I kind of tried to align it, couldn't do it too well at the bottom because I ran out of space. But I say this is cervical, this is the thoracic, this is the lumbar, see they go together kind of. This is the sacral, and this is the costogeal. Okay, what are these, what does this mean? So the cervical vertebrae is like, in, not the vertebrae, the spinal column for the cervical um, nerves are going to be what? They're going to have the most white matter. Thoracic is going to be in second place. Lumbar is in third. Sacral is in fourth. Costagio is in fifth for amounts of white matter. Okay. And then gray matter, just reverse it. Cervical is going to be in last place. Who's going to be in first place? Costagio is going to have the most gray matter, least white matter. Then sacral, then lumbar, then thoracic. Boom. Least gray matter, most white matter. Okay, and what is the white matter for? We said it's going to send the signal to our brain. So it's going to be for the tracks. It's where the tracks are going to be. Now, what says, like who says cervical is going to have more white matter and costagio is going to have less? Well, the nerves are going to say that. Okay, so if you see right here, right, this costagio nerve. The costagio nerve goes through this region, right, the white matter. This, on, the, on the sides, the bottom and the top is all white matter. If you can see with the drawing, the color in the region is gray. We spoke about that. Okay, so the costagio is going to go through this top part. It's going to be called the ventral horn or the dorsal horn. I'm sorry. And he's going to come up, right? He's going to go through this region. Okay. Now, sacral's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't want to go through the brain. Well, I'm not going to go to the costagio because I'm above him. I'm a little better, more superior. The sacral is going to hop along onto this uh, ride, and he's going to go to the lumbar region. And lumbar is like, whoa, 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 I'm coming to the brain too. He hops onto the bus or the train, however you want to think about it. Now he comes up. So now you have three different nerves. You start them off with one. So if you start off with one, right, you don't need too much space. You don't need too much room. If you have one spinal tract going through the white matter, so the white matter is the thing that's controlling the tracks. If you have one... Uh, sorry, one nerve going through this, one type of nerve, you don't need that much space. Two nerves, you need a little bit more. Three, it's not even nerves, it's regions, because the lumbar's going to have, what, five, sacral's going to have five, thoracic's going to have twelve, etc. If you go through the lumbar now, you need a little more space, because it's three. Okay, you keep, com you keep coming up, right? Thoracic's like, I'm hopping on, I'm going, I'm going to the brain. Four, four different regions. Look how big the space has got to be. Last one, cervical is like, I'm coming too, why not? Five, you have five different regions going to the brain, all passing through the cervical region. So that spinal cord that you look through, the cross-sectional view, you have five things coming through. Or you're like, Joe, why the hell? Why in the world do I just have arrows going up here? What about all this space? I'm going to talk about it. The side spaces, so if I draw like this, right? And we're going to just... Redraw them real quick. Just a standard size, right? The, you know, the, we, we already talked about it, it's all different. So this region, the posterior region, if you see it down here, I have purple arrows going up. Whoa, why? So if you go to the posterior region, you only are sending sensory information to the brain. There is no descending tracks. It is only ascending, so it's only going up. And if you're going up, it's sensory. If you're going down, it's motor. Makes sense. If you're going to the brain, you're saying something, and if you're going down, you're doing something. We'll keep going about that in a little bit, though. Okay, so the dorsal, or the, why do I keep saying that? The vent, the dorsal one, the posterior one, is only going up. Okay, so you know this is the biggest one. Well, what about the sides? Well, you see how big the sides are and the bottom is compared to the top? Why would it be like that? Okay, so the sides are called the lateral white matter. And he could go up, and he has tracks that go down. Not bad. This side is the same exact thing, but on the left side, left and right side. Symmetrical bodies are symmetrical, we know this. Boom. The middle one, up and down. They're pretty cool. Okay, so what does that mean? I'm not going to draw it on the bottom, or on the anterior view, for the ventral region, because like it's going to be a lot of like confusing overlap, but just bear with me here. If we're talking about the lateral side, right, the lateral white matter, we're going to have tracks going up and down. So you're going to need a lot of white matter.
But if we're just talking about descending, right? We'll just talk about descending first. You have cervical coming down, and boom, he branches out. Now, what could happen? Well, you only have four regions now. So the white matter could get a little smaller, and the gray matter is going to get what? A little bit larger. Boom, now you have three regions. Oh, so the white matter is shrinking even more because you only need to cover three regions. Three regions here, three regions here. Okay, so the gray matter is like, ah, oh, I got space. I could, you know, build up. We're coming down to the sacral, right? Well, when you come to the sacral, what happens? The, the, thera the sacral one, right, he pops off. He's like, ah, oh, I don't need to be here anymore. So when he pops off, you come down to the cosigeal one. All right, so the cosigeal is going to have the least amount of white matter and the most amount of gray matter because he only has one region to send like signals to. So we say, one more time, cervical, right? He, he comes off. He's like, ah, I'm gone. I'm doing my function. Thoracic, see ya, I'm doing my function. So now you're missing both uh, cervical and thoracic. Come to lumbar, you're like, adios, hasta la vista. Doing my function. Sacral the same, and then cosigeal. So boom, that's how we know the white matter is going to be the most. Because the white matter is going to control the tracks, where things are going to go up, and things are going to come back down. The gray matter on the, hand, uh, on the other hand, I apologize, is going to control something else. I'm going to talk about it right now. Okay, so you see this whole region, right? Kind of looks like it's all over the place. It's not. It's not. It makes a lot of sense if you just focus on it. So the spinal nerve, right? He's going to be mainly used with the gray matter, but all these functions, they come into, they integrate with each other, right? Gray matter is going to help out white matter. White matter is going to help out gray matter, etc. I'm going to talk about how they help each other out or how they work hand in hand, right? They're going to work together. But let's take it from the top real quick. Ventral, right? Uh, dorsal, I'm sorry. Dorsal is the posterior gray is the posterior region. Dorsal white column is known as the dorsal funiculus. Dorsal funiculus. Boom. The lateral sides are known as the lateral white column, right? They're going to have white matter in it. And you see I have the arrows going up and going down. Could do both. Ascend and descend. The last one, ventral white column, bottom one. Arrows going up and down. Now, what else do I have? Right here I have written posterior gray horn. Okay, so the posterior gray horn is going to be used for sensory information. Fine. Anterior gray horn is going to be used for what? Motor information. Okay, didn't we just say that the ascending tracks were for sensory and then the descending tracks were for motor? Yeah, they all help each other out, like we said. Okay, we're going to talk about how these things go now. Okay, so right here, you see how these little like lines connecting and lines connecting? These things are called rootlets. So you have a bunch of little rootlets connecting to form one major root. Okay. What is the top one called? It's going to be called the dorsal root. And the bottom one is going to be the anterior root. So the anterior root, also known as the ventral root, right? And then the dorsal root, also known as the posterior root, it's going to be in the back. So this is going to be the back, this is going to be the bottom. Or the front, sorry. Okay, you see I have all these like little dotted lines going? What does this mean? Okay, so for these are all spinal nerves, right? What is a spinal nerve? It's when you mix a motor and a sensory nerve. What is that? Well, I said the posterior gray horn is for sensory, and the anterior gray horn is for motor, right? You have sensory on both sides. Both of them are the posterior. Both of these guys are the anterior. So when they combine together, you're going to form a spinal nerve. Okay, so a sense is going to say something, the motor is going to perform the action. Here we go. So now, example. Your skin and your muscles. I hit my arm, right? Or something lands on my arm, like a little mosquito. I'm like, okay, I sense that. Who senses it? Okay, so the skin is going to have sensory uh, control. And if it's on my arm, it's going to go where? Well, if it's on my arm, let me just say this real quick. The dorsal rami and the ventral rami is where the nerves are going to flow through. So if we're going to the back, the neck, and the trunk, we're going to go through the dorsal rami. If we're going to the anterior trunk, the lateral trunk, and the lens, we're going to go down through the ventral rami, okay? For both sensory and both for motor control. Now, bug lens on my arm, right? So, hits my skin. 
I'm gonna send the fiber, the fiber's gonna go through where? The ventral rami, because it's what? My anterior, my lateral, or my lens. Okay. So I'm gonna go through the ventral rami. Now, same mosquito, right? I swat him off my arm, lands on my leg. I'm like, okay, swat him off my leg. How am I gonna realize he's touching my leg? Well, he's gonna go through where? Same exact thing. Motor. Oh, uh, not motor, I'm sorry. The ventral rami, because it's the lens. I swipe that bug again. Where does he land? He lands on my back. I can't see him. Who can see him? My nerves can feel him. So my nerves feel him. And where are they gonna send the signal to? They're gonna send it through the dorsal rami. Okay. But everything in the body kind of works together. So if I go through my limbs, my arm or my leg, we're going through ventral, back we're going through the dorsal. See the blue line, I have it dashed. So when these blue lines, they come together, they're gonna join and they're gonna go through the dorsal root. Okay, so this is where they combine. The dorsal root is gonna be the region where the sensory information is gonna flow. Who cares about the rami? They're both coming through the rami, it's just location. But the root or the dorsal area is where the sensory supply is gonna go. Okay, he's gonna come through, right? And he's going to come into this uh, region. He's going to stimulate into an interneuron, etc. We're going to talk about the different tracks. But in order for the sensory information to go through the brain, or go to the, go, uh, yeah, go to the brain, he's got to go somewhere. And he's going to go into one of these tracks. Lateral, lateral, ventral, or dorsal. We're going to talk about which one goes where, but just for the sake of the video, I'm going to say we're going into the dorsal, right? And we said all the dorsal fibers go up. Okay, so he's going straight out. He's going straight up, right? Hits the brain. Brain's like, all right, I got you. I'm going to send something back. For the sake of the video, we're going to talk about the different tracks in a little bit. But it's, the brain sends it back through the ventral, uh, through the lateral. The lateral is like, okay, I see there's a bug on your back. Do something about it. What is he going to do about it? Well, he's going to send this down. And we're going to become a motor nerve, or the motor neurons. We're going to stimulate the muscles. How? So he's going to go through the anterior root. Okay. And now it's in the anterior root. If I'm swiping him off my freaking leg or my arm, where are we going? We're going down the ventral rami. Oh, okay. So if I'm going down the ventral rami, I'm going to stimulate my limbs. And it's like, oh, I hit it off my arm. So my movement to get him off of my arm, or to get it off of my leg, was from the muscles, the motor, the bottom region. The sensation itself was from the sensory, okay? I hit him off my arm, I hit him off my leg. This guy lands on my back, of course, right? How do I know he's on my back? The sensory region sent it through the dorsal, the dorsal sends it to my brain, and now how am I gonna get him off my back? Well, he's gonna come through the anterior root again, but where's he gonna pass? He's gonna pass through the dorsal rami. Fire. When he passes through the dorsal rami, the muscles are gonna be like, oh, let me twitch, let me move him off of me. Something like that, right? I don't know, however you get a bug off, like slam your back off a wall, I don't know. But that's how you're gonna feel it and the muscles are gonna move or like try to jitter to get it off. This is not just a bug example, it could be like a pin prick, it could be a lot of different things. Just trying to be very basic for now. Okay, so that is basically the consensus of how the spinal cord and the different spinal nerves interact with each other. There's going to be a lot of different tracks for a lot of different functions and a lot of different pain and stuff that I'm going to talk about in the next coming videos. If I did it all in one video, we're going to be here for five hours. So before I do that, I kind of probably want to talk about a question, just like kind of refresh everything, but just kind of get a good idea of what I was trying to say here. How the different motors or how the different fibers uh, target the senses, target the movement, and basically why there's more white matter in the cervical region and more gray matter in the casa jail region, just based upon the fibers and nerves that run through it. Okay, so quick question before we move on. An individual is involved in an accident and gets road rash, okay? They notice that the injury is on the posterior side of their leg, okay? The nerve involved is a posterior cutaneous nerve. Which of the following represents the proper proportion of matter that this nerve travels through? Okay, so what is relevant here? Well, I mean, I guess this is fine. This is just like a scrape and like a cuts and like scrapes and like bleeding in their skin. But it, 
Okay, it tells us the posterior side of their leg, so we know that. But it says the nerve involved in the posterior cutaneous nerve. So this is the most important thing, posterior cutaneous nerve. Okay, and we know that this nerve is what? Travels through the sacral region. Okay, and then it says, what is the proportion of matter that this nerve travels through? Okay, so let's draw our circles. Boom, 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 boom. What am I drawing? Just like spinal cord segments, the cross-sectional views that we spoke about in the video. Let's see, really bad artwork here. Okay. And if we remember, what, uh, what are they asking for? The type of matter. Okay, so we know when cervical, and then what? Thoracic, lumbar, sacral. Cosageal. Okay, and it says it's the sacral region, right? So this is what we're looking at. So now, if we recall, the nerves, right? So it's a sensory nerve. Okay, so we know it's going where? Well, it's going through to the brain. So the brain's up here. And these nerves got to travel which direction? Well, they're traveling upward. So we're going to have one nerve coming up here from cosageal. We're going to have, let's see... Sacral coming up, right? This is passing through the ventral root in particular, but just for the picture purposes, I'm going to draw it like this. What makes it easier? Okay, so there's a lot of space. Okay, and it's sensory, so it's going to the brain, going through the white matter. Hmm, the sacral region. Let's see, most white or most gray? Well, what is this saying? Mostly white matter and mostly gray matter. We don't even, that's not even one of them. Like, we didn't even, that's not even a thing. So he's wrong. Mostly white, least gray. Okay, so most white would be over here, and the least gray, that would be the cervical, so that's wrong. What about most gray and least white? So if he's mostly gray, mostly gray was cosageal, or most gray, I'm sorry, most gray is cosageal, and the least white, that's cosageal, so that's wrong. They're giving us two options. So if we only remember one of them, so if we only remember what's mostly white or what's most gray, we should be able to get the answer, but for the sake of the video, we're just going to do both. Mostly gray some way. So which one is mostly gray? Well, cosageal is most gray. Sacral, probably most of it is gray, and some of it is white. So this looks pretty good. We'll see. And let's see, mostly white, some gray. Well, if it's mostly white, it's probably going to be by the cervical or the thoracic, so it'll be up here. And some gray, yeah, that's going to be over here. So mostly white, some gray is probably going to be thoracic, maybe lumbar. It's probably going to be thoracic, so that's going to be wrong. So this is the only one we're left with. Mostly gray, some white. That's going to be between cosageal and sacral because most of it is the shaded in region. But they said some of it was white, so it's got to be sacral. Lumbar is a 50-50. But, yeah, so this is how you get to that answer. So, I don't know. I hope that little question helped. The last part this is going to be really quick. This is uh, this region right here, or what I'm talking about. This is where all the different tracks are going to go. This is very, very broad. So we remember we have the dorsal column, dorsal white column, right? We have the ventral white column, and we have the lateral white columns, right? Okay, so the dorsal column is going to have the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cutaneus. These are just going to be tracts. Okay, so these tracts, the dorsal column tract, I'm going to post a video. You can click the link right here, and you'll be able to tell, or you can watch the video on how these uh, different tracts proceed through the column up to the, where? Brain. The dorsal column, right? Travels to the brain. So that's going to be one type of tract. Now the lateral white column. We're going to have the lateral corticospinal tract. We're going to have the rubrospinal tract. We're going to have the dorsal cerebellar spinal tract. We're going to have the ventral spinal cerebellar tract. We're going to have the spinal olivary tract. And we're also going to have the lateral spinal thalamic tract. I know that is a lot. But all of these different tracks, right, they're going to go, why is it so many? Why is it more than the dorsal? Because the lateral ones can go up or down, right? You could, well, that's both ways. Up or down, right? You can go either or. So if you continue watching the videos, you're going to see I'm going to have a lecture on the tracks, the lateral white column tracks. All of these different tracks are going to be in another video. If you click the link or if you click this right here, it'll take you there right now. But I think it's best to watch it in orderly fashion from dorsal then to lateral, then to ventral, but whatever floats your boat. 
Last one, we're going to have the ventral Y column. And then we're going to mount tail. Why? Because you can go up or you can go down. We're going to have the lateral reticular spinal tract. We're going to have the medial reticular spinal tract, the vestibulo spinal tract, the tecto spinal tract, the ventral anterior spinal tract, or anterior cortico spinal tract. And we're also going to have the anterior spinal thalamic tract. I know it's a lot, but the video, if you click right here, if you see in the video, I will have all of it broken down very nicely. I'm not gonna go too crazy in it. It's really not too much. If you could just grasp what goes in what category, it's gonna make everything else in the next coming lectures make a lot more sense. Because when we talk about the pons, the medulla, the rest of the brain stem, all the way up to the cerebrum and all the clinical functions, I personally think it's the most important way if we know from the, the bottom up. What do I mean the bottom up? Well, the spinal cord is gonna be the bottom. He's gonna be our foundation, right? Because everything is happening from him and we're sending it to the brain. So I'm gonna work in the next videos from the bottom, the base, we're gonna build a really strong foundation, which we just did over here, from the base, and we're just gonna proceed upwards. If we proceed upwards, eventually when we start talking to other parts of the brain, like the pons, cere cerebellum, cerebrum, thalamus, etc., things are gonna start overlapping. It's gonna make it a lot easier. So instead of learning like 20 different structures in the thalamus, you're only gonna to have to learn eight because you know where all these structures go. It's gonna make things a lot more sense, a lot more, less memorizing, a lot more understanding. But yeah, just, I don't know, I hope it helped.